This is Duke University. Welcome one and all. This afternoon's session will bring Duke students in conversation with scholars working in various disciplines on contemporary and classical aesthetic modes that translate various lines in Islamic thought and philosophy into built forms, mosque, and the digital arts. The inspiration for the first session, and Yasser was wondering what he's doing here, so here it is, Yasser. Mm -hmm. um, the inspiration for the first session stemmed from a talk by Yasser Taba when he was at NYU Abu Dhabi, a talk in which he did an amazing semiotic study of sacred architecture, specifically Shia shrines, to understand the way in which they were informed structurally by a philosophy that adheres to the emanation of divine light. His work in, in the semiotics of sacred architecture is uh, almost singular, I would say, at least unique amongst art historians. And like the black swan of uh, Hent de Vries' talk this morning, it takes our understanding of architecture into surprising new spheres in aesthetics and the senses. And this is where Laura Marx's work uh, comes in. Um, I have been teaching Laura Marx in uh, film studies for years. Uh, she's been working in, on intercultural cinema, including works from Muslim-majority countries, um, in, in her study of both uh, film and digital, film, uh, digital media. But her most recent work, Enfoldment and Infinity, is perhaps uh, one of those surprising examples uh, of the unpredictable places in which uh, Yasser's work has traveled. Yasser's, uh, Yasser Taba's study of the Mukarnas domes of the mosque, a semiotics that ties the dome of the mosque to theological formations that then come to inform uh, Laura Marx's reading of contemporary experimental and digital um, digital and new media, both in the Middle East and elsewhere. Here to introduce uh, Yasser Taba and Laura Marx's work and to lead us into a public conversation uh, about their works are students in uh, my Islam and cinema class. Anna uh, Kipervasser is a Ukrainian-born filmmaker and multimedia artist. Uh, she is sitting right there. Uh, Anna has um, exhibited and curated exhibitions and film screenings nationally since 2001 and has been the recipient of numerous grants and awards. Anna's time in the Middle East uh, moved her to establish a film company called uh, On Look Films. Her first feature film is in post-production now. It's to be completed by the end of uh, this year. The film documents the call to prayer in Cairo as a 1,400-year-old tradition which is transformed by modern technology and as Egypt itself transforms through revolution and regime change. The film explores the complex relationship between individual and collective voices. Anna is now pursuing her MFA in our new uh, experimental and documentary arts program here at Duke. Rose Wilson, who is sitting in the middle over there, is currently pursuing a master's degree in English with a concentration in film at North Carolina State University. She's previously earned a Master of Arts in uh, Liberal Studies at Duke University and holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Meredith College. Before she began her studies in film, Rose worked on research projects for the Duke Memory Disorders Clinic, the Institute for Genome Science and Policy, the Center for Child and Family Policy, the Social Science Research Institute, and the Program in Education. She is currently working on research related to the representation of memory, cognition, and mental space in film. So. Uh, 
Anna and Rose will be uh, introducing Yasser Tauba and Laura Marks, and Alyssa Miller will be asking questions that we in class and they together have uh, come up with in their discussion of their work. Um, Alyssa Miller is a doctoral candidate in in the Cultural Anthropology Department at Duke University. She holds a master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Texas, where she completed a thesis that examined representations of animality in the Lebanese Civil War novel. Her current research engages questions of ethics, citizenship, and social justice in the marginal geographies of Tunisia following its uh, 2011 revolution, a project that draws on theories of aesthetics, biopolitics, and new materialism. I am thrilled to have you introduce two of my most favorite writers in the world. So. Um, I will speak about the structure of my talk briefly. Um, I will speak and a video, which is a slideshow, will play. Um, there are 57 images to look at. It is structured this way because in the end, you will understand why. And I will pause briefly at moments where there are slides that have text. The text is pulled from uh, chapter five of Yasser Taba's book, The Transformation of Islamic Art During the Sunni Revival. Should we turn the lights down? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, I will first introduce Yasser Taba's book, the transformation of Islamic art during the Sunni revival by reading a summary of the entire book, a summary that I did not write, in fact. I will do so to provide context for the chapter that I will then summarize. Momentous developments occurred in the field of Islamic art during the 11th and 12th centuries, developments that were to affect its aesthetic direction for centuries to come but which sprang from deep within a political and religious clash at the heart of the Muslim world. Iran, Iraq, and Syria were to see the flourishing of such devices as proportional calligraphy, vegetal and geometric arabesque and mukarnas, stalactite vaulting, which is the form in question. But these innovations were propagated in a highly confrontational atmosphere that pitched the traditional Sunnism of the Abbasid Caliphate against the Fatimids of Egypt. Yasser Taba, examining the semiotic interplay between history and art, just making sure, uh, challenges the conventional methodologies of many historians of Islamic art today. In subject matter and approach, the transformation of Islamic art during the Sunni revival makes original contributions to the study of art, revealing that this relatively neglected sector of medieval art and architecture is of critical importance for reevaluating the entire field of Islamic studies. It challenges the essentialist and positivist approaches that still permeate the study of Islamic art and offers a historical and semiotic alternative for exploring meaning within ruptures of change. The book is a case study where art and architecture reflect the politics and the religious realm of Islamic society of the 11th and 12th centuries in what is a fraction of the Muslim majority world. In chapter five, Yasser Taba attempts to delineate both etymologically and historically. Oh no, it's, it's correct, it's too late. Sorry. Um, thank you. Um, so in chapter five, Yasser Taba attempts to delineate both etymologically and historically the origin and development of a specific architectural form, which was dominant in Islamic architecture from the 11th to 15th centuries. He does so in order to demystify its historical significance and interpretation. The form in question, again, is the Mukarnas form. There is much debate about this form, including the etymology of the word attributed to the form, and Taba argues multiple non-traditional readings. <laughs> After looking at several etymologies, he argues for both Kirnas or Kurnas, the slide you saw, generally denoting the part of a mountain that projects outward 
much as the nose projects from a human face. Interestingly, both Karnasa and Kurnas allude to some of the main features of Mukarnas as an architectural form, including subdivision and unsupported projection. Yet these terms of limited use predated the architectural form, meaning that the term expanded to embody the new architecture. Finally, the term Mukarnas lives between noun and adjective, <laughs> meaning it is between being and becoming. This will become important later. While true Mukarnas did not develop until the mid to late 11th century, forms found in Central Asia and Iran, starting from the late 10th century, were not so distant relatives, which potentially led to the development of elaborate subdivision in architecture, which became known as Mukarnas. The use of early Mukarnas is also found in Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Egypt, and other parts of North Africa. Taba argues that true Mukarnas developed out of Baghdad, yet there are little to no examples in existence due to Baghdad's history, as we all know. While there is textual evidence and several paintings still survive, which do show Baghdad with numerous Mukarnas domes from the period, this is one of the only surviving specimens. The shrine of Imam Abdullah at Tur, dating to 1085 AD, within 70 kilometers of Baghdad. Taba says that although few medieval structures survive in Baghdad, oh, I'm so sorry, yeah, that's, that's correct, um, a form at this level of development, situated as it is in a tiny village, suggests the existence of earlier models in an urban center. This center can obviously only be Baghdad, the still vibrant capital of the Abbasids and Sunni Islam. Taba goes on to trace the development of the Mukarnas dome through geographical transformations, as well as political and philosophical influence of the Abbasid Caliphate, the Almoravid dynasty, and the Ash'ari theology. The Abbasid's capital was Baghdad for much of its rule, from 750 to 1258 AD, and whose tradition of dome building made domes the most important architectural element to which the Mukarnas were then applied, thereby transforming the Abbasid dome development. The Almoravid dynasty, ruling from 1040 to 1147 AD, brought Mukarnas to North Africa through borrowings from the Abbasid Caliphate. The Ash'ari theology, known as occasionalism, founded in the 10th century, of which the chief theologian wrote treatises opposing then contemporary Mutazili theology and Fatimid rule while valorizing Sunni traditionalism and Abbasid rule. For Taba, the above three factors created the intersection that permitted Mukarnas to come into existence. Taba challenges previously held conceptions about the development of architectural use of Mukarnas as well as the interpretation of reasons for its use and the meaning that these structures inherently possess. He provides examples throughout the chapter, leading the reader via a chronology of historical events. The Mukarnas dome might thus have been created during this time of heated debate as a symbolic manifestation of an occasionalist universe and a distinctive emblem of the resurgent Abbasid state, the safeguard of the Muslim community. The Mukarnas dome, from very early on, was employed as a highly charged symbolic form in both secular and religious contexts. Based on what we have thus established, two conclusions can be reached. Conclusion number one, Mukarnas forms, I will pause for one moment. Mukarnas forms were applied in religious and secular architecture alike, including mosques, palaces, schools, and hospitals, which means to Taba that the socio-political transformations of the time were affecting the thinking of the people as a whole, not any one segment. Further, Christians were also inspired by Mukarnas forms, evident in descriptions and poetic responses written by Christian monks that alluded to Mukarnas domes as representations of the heavens and the universe at large. Conclusion number two. Interpretation of the Mukarnas dome is found in the form, albeit 
a spiritual interpretation. Taba opened this chapter by rejecting all definitions and interpretations of mukarnas used throughout history. He then approached the question of meaning through a studious exploration of origin and development of term and form, while also considering the political and philosophical conditions present at the time of origin and throughout development of the form. The conclusion he reaches regarding meaning is formalist in nature. Although he does reach it by considering the Ash'ari theological influence, whose occasionalist cosmology was the theory of atoms and accidents, where in the world everything other than God was composed of atoms and accidents. Accidents could not endure within matter for longer than an instant, but were continuously being changed by God through a continuous process of annihilation and recreation God alone can guarantee the order and consistency of the universe by preserving the accidental combinations of forms. Although a dome usually gives the impression of unity, the mukarnas gives the impression of dazzling fragmentation. Taba finds that occasionalism and the formal properties of the mukarnas dome are related, both displaying ideas of fragmentation, impermanence, and imminent collapse, while alluding to and suggesting the complementation of omnipotence and eternity of God. Mukarnas gives the illusion of resting on no material support, induces submission and wonder. In fact, Taba wonders if the Mukarnas dome was directly intended as a physical manifestation of occasionalist concept, an expanded outgrowth of atomism, which also has an idea of the minimal part. All matter is composed of minimal parts, Space, motion, and time are composed of invisible, indivisible minimal parts. I will give a moment to this slide. I love this poem. Oh, yeah. are written in, written in roundels all underneath one of the domes in the office. A lot of couplets, sorry. In Granada. No, you're perfect. This is what it's for. Um, my deduction, actually, is that mukarnas, since mukarnas is neither a noun or an adjective, the word doesn't quite fit into the physical word, world, nor into the other world. The form and the term both live between being and becoming. Yasser Taba argues that the Mukarnas form cannot be considered without looking at the structural element it is transforming, for example, the dome. It can be said that the Mukarnas was not only transforming architectural forms, but because of the political and religious climate at the time of Mukarnas coming into existence. It can be said that Mukarnas were as instrumental in turning the eye of the visitor, the beholder, towards the heavens and towards the contemplation of an ever-expanding, ever-changing universe, thus further perpetuating Sunni revival and Ashari occasionalism. Wow. Uh, so how do we do with this now? No, I think Rose will go ahead. With okay, her okay. Um, so I'm going to discuss a couple of chapters from uh, Laura Marx's book, Enfoldment and Infinity. I should probably move that over there. Um, An Islamic Genealogy of New Media Art. I'm going to um, try and distill a lot of her arguments. And in the beginning, that might be sort of um, to the exclusion of some of her examples, which I'm going to save for uh, when we get to more of the digital media and film stuff because that's what I do. Um, so, yeah. Marx argues that there's a broad continuity between Islamic and Western aesthetics. 
This continuity, she says, is visible in the strong similarities, perceptible and philosophical, between con contemporary new media art and classical Islamic art. It is more than an analogy for her. The Islamic quality of modern and new media art is also a latent or deeply enfolded historical inheritance from Islamic art and thought. Her project is, um, in a sense, a Foucauldian genealogy insofar as she asserts connections on the basis of what she calls suspicious evidence, but not suspicious because it is false, but because it lies in a history of forgettings, misappropriations, and disavowals. History, she argues, proceeds not through ruptures, but through folds. Um, in this book, her methodological, methodological preference is for um, existential phenomenology. So she's using her own experience, sensory and mental, as the basis for analysis, but she doesn't necessarily assume that that experience can be generalized. Um, another caveat she sort of puts in the introduction is that the taxonomy, taxonomy of an Islamic art um, would be a Western concern, that it's drawing from disparate traditions um, and it's kind of a broad category. In the aesthetics of enfolding and unfolding that she proposes, she puts forward three levels, image, information, and the infinite. Um, these enfold each other and unfold from each other. So the relationship that she proposes is that the image is an interface to the information and the information is an interface to the infinite. The interface may make a user aware of the relationship between code and the world, or it may completely obscure that. I would say that's similar to the way the visual grammar um, sometimes works in film. She's, uh, many of the artworks that she uses in the book, um, both the new media and the Islamic, um, privilege the disruption of the signal or um, the difficulty of extracting signal from noise. Um, she situates her theory as an intervention into Deleuzian theory of signs which inserts another um, plane between images and the infinite, and that is the information. It's a plane through which the semiotic process passes before image can arise. She argues that this intervention highlights the importance of non-perceptual forces that intervene in the process of semiosis. She explains that in new media art, there is a layer of code underlying the perceptibles we see, hear, and touch. And she argues for uh, a similar occurrence in Islamic art. So perceptible artifacts such as calligraphy make the perceiver aware to some degree of the underlying code that generated them, in that case, the sacred word of the Quran. Islamic art could perhaps be described, she says, as a complex set of interfaces to the Quran, but the Quran is an interface to something indefinitely large, indeed ungraspable, namely God. Islamic art and abstract computer-based art are both especially concerned with showing through image how information tells us something about the infinite. Enfolding and unfolding aesthetics then may be useful for analyzing how artworks and other things actively triangulate among image, information, and the infinite. It helps us to observe the manner in which artworks select certain elements to unfold, and it can help us evaluate what is privileged and passed over, in the selection of information, and what information is privileged in the selection of the image. Engaging with Islamic art, like engaging with um, something like time image cinema, gives rise to new perceptions, affections, and thoughts, in which, uh, which in the case of a religious person may permit a, uh, a kind of contemplation of divinity. As she seeks to establish a parallel between the art of Islam and the system-based art of compute, computers, Marx says that it remains clear that both fascinate because they invite the impossible task of contemplating infinity. Islam invokes a qualitative infinity. The infinity of information technology, on the other hand, is quantitative. Computers' capacity for calculations inspires all. Web pages number in the billions. And there is more out there and in there in the mysterious universe of code than we can possibly imagine. But it is all the same kind of thing. She calls this a kind of lame infinity. <laughs> I like it. Um, similarly, she argues that computer-generated virtual worlds are as actual as can be because they are produced by the programs written to produce them. Um, those so-called virtual worlds provide, at best, a lame virtuality. So, similar thing there. The true virtual, or um, what she calls the imminent infinite, is an, 
she says, an unfathomably vast web of interdependencies. So insofar as we and others exist, it is because we are all communicating. And by we, she means not just living creatures, but inanimate things and immaterial things as well. Um, and we'll come back to the minimal part later, but I do just want to say that she says, the minimal part, whether atom, point, or pixel, forms the basis of standardized calligraphy and conservative new media work that obfuscate the relationship between pixel-based image and the underlying software. She suggests that Islamic atomism offers a strong parallel to the bewildered passivity that characterizes contemporary cultures of globalization. Absolute and iconism, which again we'll come back to, can be compared to contemporary computer-based art in that it refuses to unfold, unfold its code. Unfold. Um, in, his, in, atomic, in Atomist ontology, the universe consists only of God, who is eternal, and this may be familiar as well, and atoms and accidents, which are temporal. There is no soul. If life inheres in a creature, it is because it inheres in each of its atoms. The accident of continuing to exist is God's command to a thing, and as soon as God ceases his creative act, everything ceases to exist. So nothing can be counted on to endure. As Mohsen Mahdi puts it, um, the atomist world does not have its inner structure, but emphasizes God activity at every point, so it's performative. In theology and aesthetics, mystical atomism privileges blind faith in a chaotic world. These beliefs correspond to the pixel-driven, accidental, and mystical or quasi-mystical properties of both Islamic art and computer art. And here Marx um, brings in uh, Yasser Taba's work, um, which she calls an influential and controversial argument, which correlates anti-rationalist atomism with the development of a uniquely Islamic architectural form, Lumukarnas. Um, these are the honeycomb-like structures um, that when placed repetitively can cover various surfaces such as domes and vaults. Um, some emphasize rational geometry and perceptible relationships, but later variants disavow the structural support and, she says, dazzle the senses with end endlessly multiplying forms. So we can take a look at a couple of... Oh. Sorry about that. Um, so, again, this is familiar, but usually a dome gives the impression of unity. It's smooth curvature, encompassing space, but when mukarnas are applied, the entire surface of a dome gives a sense not of unity, but of assemblage of infinitesimal parts. Taba argues that this implies a particular attitude about the nature of matter, that it consists of disconnected atoms held together by the will of God alone. Looking up at the mukarnas dome gives the impression of insubstantiality, the twinkling crystalline structures Thwart attempts to understand its rational structure and instead invite a more effective re relationship to space. In Baroque fashion, it invites helpless ecstasy rather than calm contemplation. I think here we see some of her um, existential phenomenology there. So. Um, the Mukarnas Dome, Taba argues again, is intended to reflect the fragmented, perishable, and transient nature of the universe while alluding to the omnipotence of eternity of God and eternity of God who can keep the dome from collapsing, just as he can keep the universe from destruction. Similarly, in the architecture of 12th century Syria, the technique of fabricating structural elements of a building from discontinuous or multicolored blocks of stone make the, bu make the building appear to have no material support. By baffling, comprehension, by, the, by baffling comprehension, the structure play into an, the structures play into an aesthetic of, submiss of submissive wonder. Okay. Um, at the Alhambra in Granada, um, which is one of the most complex ceilings in the Islamic world, arguably the, the Mukarnas Dome in the Hall of Two Sisters, which is one of those that you saw, um, deeply sculpted, subdivided into 5,000 cells, illuminated by windows around its base, the dome twinkles and shimmers in a thousand points of light and shadow. The Alhambra represents a final elaboration of the dazzling play of light and darkness matter and emptiness that Taba argues was first established in the Sunni revival architecture of the 11th century. Um, so I'll interject here to say that I think this matter and emptiness piece um, is probably the most compelling for me in its relationship to digital art because you have presence and absence of matter or light um, 
which parallels the presence or absence of signal or electricity, um, ones or zeros, that sort of thing. Um, I can't also but help see an affinity to one of the images you mentioned early in the book, which is the image of the universe expanding and contracting like a heart. Um, so, um, uh, do you want to? Um, so at this point, Marx moves from her discussion of atomism in architecture to a contemplation of atomistic principles in cinema and new media. Um, she says an Islamic aesthetics of cinema is or would be one that is based on atomism and characterized by a dynamic of appearance and disappearance. Film theorist Jalal Chofik describes a hypothetical cinema that would exploit Islamic atomist principles. He suggests that the film's frame by frame structure supports an aesthetics of appearance and disappearance and that what really interpolates the viewer of a film is not the image but the jump cut which alerts him or her to her to his or her substitution by another similar entity and his or her annihilation into the one and only subject annihilation into a larger entity marx argues and incomprehension of one's relation to that power powerful other except through submission these both describe or this describes both mystical atomism and a certain relationship to the computer. Further, she likens the unity of God to the unity of code. Experimental film and video took, uh, took early to the idea of the minimal part, um, and that the minimal part of their media is not a unit of narrative, but a formal or physical unit. Most such works use deconstructive techniques to discover meanings hidden at the level of narrative but some shatter the media into what she calls crystalline fragments that aim to dazzle and disorient as much as the Mukarnas domes do. Marx argues that the idea of the minimal part or atom is more at home with new digital and interactive media, but she su suggests that it began in frame-based media with projects like um, the Flickr films of Sheritz and Conrad, um, which are composed of single frames or brief shots edited with obvious uh, con false continuity. Um, I wanted to show you guys just a bit of this one, but you won't have time to get a real sense of it, but maybe. Sorry, yeah, I know it's just a teaser, but we could watch videos all day. So, yeah, already there. Carrying on. Okay. All right, so um, she says that structural filmmakers painstakingly edited together these single frames or brief sequences of frames in a way that drew attention to, their, to the handcraft of their process. And I'm, I would say that this is true of new digital, or no, she says this, this is also true of um, digital frame stitching now. Um, so this breaks the universe of continuity editing into atoms that cannot quite manage to be, which I love. Um, Marx then moves from a discussion of the frame to a discussion of the point and the pixel, each of which she treats as the smallest unit or minimal part in its particular medium. She says, in the system of writing attributed to Ibn Mukla, standardization was based on, principle, based on multiples of the smallest mark, the cross-section of a reed pen as a point, rhomboid in shape. This point becomes the basis of all other measurement. 
And the point-based politics of standardization translates well into the world created by computers. Like the body as described by Atomist, digital objects are composed of minimal parts, including on and off signals, bit and bytes of information, the pixel, and our modern term for the three-dimensional part, the voxel. They are necessarily discrete, for logic only works with minimal parts. She argues that it is not an overstatement to say that the pixel-based screen, like the point-based writing, centralizes meaning and access in corporate powers. New media works that emphasize their pixel-based or otherwise standardized construction can call attention to the way that they have been constructed and invite the viewer to see between or beyond their pixels or minimal parts. Marx continues, a beautiful example is Bitfall by Julius Pop. We will see if it will play in the slideshow. Oh, is it there? But sorry, you didn't see that yet. Okay, this one's going to cooperate. This work looks like a waterfall magically composed of words. The software selects words that most commonly occur in the internet news sites, and the effect of falling water text is produced by 240 magnetic jets that eject letters one liquid pixel at a time. Bitfall is produced with the most regular sampling, but its watery element allows us to see each pixel is composed of a democracy in flux. It is similar to the mystical contemplation that an exquisitely regular cal calligraphy calligraphic work invites. Marx goes on to draw another parallel between works of web art and Islamic atomism by citing the feelings of powerlessness or helplessness that they incite in the worshiper or user. Um, Finna or blissful annihilation, she says, is courted by computer artworks that crash computers or collapse their visible interface in folding their information. The standard bearer of Finna in the digital age is Jody, whose complex programming renders opaque the supposed transparency of standard graphical user interfaces, like the WYSIWYG kind of interface. Um, the artist programmers who created Jody insist that a correlation between perceptible forms and the software that gives rise to them isn't necessary. And the Jody website does a number of things to your computer that are not nice, which I did not want to do to this lovely computer. So here is just an example. Um, and that's what you see when you go to the main homepage. Um, and it you know, looks like a lot of gibberish. Um, but if you actually right click on it and view the source code, you get a lovely pattern, which I believe is Teletubbies. So, so I think that situates it historically, but also shows the pattern that's not viewable unless you have access to it. As early as the late 1990s, Mark said, digital video artists began to realize that the basic unit they had to work with was no longer the frame, but the algorithm. Didn't put a blank sign in there. Uh, more recent computer-based art at times manifest a desire to strip away all interfaces in order to confront the user with the infinite, not the divine infinite, but the infinitely extensive pain of digital memory plane of digital memory. Um, such works are often aniconic. So absolute aniconism, which, the Islamic, which in, Islam, in Islamic art demands the elimination of human, animal, and even sometimes plant forms, and resulted in more figurative motifs um, being replaced by geometry and calligraphy, is in digital art or media the refusal to unfold its code. Marx says that art is aniconic when the image shows us what we do not see is more significant than what we do. Though it is not her, um, the way that she concludes her chapter, I'd like to sum it up um, with this quote. For artists like Jody, what first engenders wonder all or the sublime experience of believing a virus has destroyed one's files gives way to critical understanding of the relationship between software and its effects. Islamic atomism, therefore, um, a theory that rose in the ninth century to account for the inexplic inexplicable actions of an unknown and all-powerful God is newly relevant in our deeply interconnected, yet apparently fragmented, contemporary world. You know, early on I said, I don't know what I'm doing here, but I really feel at home. <laughs> and I feel at home thanks 
to the excellent preparation and warm welcome by uh, Nagar and Ellen. And by the really outstanding job that Anna did, so much so that uh, you know, it makes some of what I want to say uh, a little superfluous. I loved the, what you said about it's a form between, uh, that lives between being and becoming. I did not love as much being described as a formalist. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I, I'll, I'll get to that because uh, my emphasis on form at the time was really a response to the dominance of reading Islamic architecture as a receptacle for inscriptions. So I was really, I wanted to read meaning in the, uh, in the form. So in the following, I just want to say a few things about how I, how I arrived at this. And then so, so much of it was summarized. I'll move on to another project that is related and then summarize a little bit. So back in the mid-70s when I began my graduate studies, the little theory that was available for Islamic art was dominated by a perennialist pursuit of purity, a search for a timeless essence of Islamic art uncontaminated by history, politics, or controversy. Appealing either to Tawheed or some form of integrative Sufism, these books were often written by architects or by those who saw the light. Somewhat different was the charge of the Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture, which was also founded then, which was to, bridge, to make bridges between the history of Islamic art and architecture and architectural practice. So a young, limited field and a huge field of, of course, of uh, the practice of architecture. Given the fact that architecture at the time was undergoing a decisively historicist phase, architecture student, I was taught often by my dean, needed to know just enough history in order to apply at the drafting table. This had a deeper anxiety, I think, which was how to, how to remain relevant in a postmodern world that called for architectural engagement in this case specifically with Islamic cultures. So a historically grounded aesthetic theory of Islamic architecture was needed. Oh. Oleg Rabar was in charge then, making in the, in, in the late 1970s a rather startling shift from social history of art to semiotics and aesthetics theory. Much maligned as vacuously fashionable, I think Rabar's switch was motivated by his increased involvement with architectural practice as a founding member of the Al Khan program and the award. Myself, within a year of arriving at MIT in 1982, I caught the bug, putting aside indefinitely a nice dissertation on architectural patronage. I don't recommend this to any young scholar. <laughs> uh, I put it aside indefinitely, and I got into Islamic theology and philosophy, where I hope to find an intellectual context for developments in architecture. I gave a venturesome paper which was published uh, in 1984 in which I linked, uh, as already was said, the development of Mukharna's vaulting with occasional theology of the 11th century. It was an exciting discovery, but frankly it was disorienting. It was almost like climbing some kind of a, getting to some kind of a peak without having any climbing skills. Because, or like living on some fourth floor in a, in a building that has no foundations. So, the following paper uh, it retreads some of these uh, tracks that led to this discovery and, that were published in my book. But more importantly, I would like to link this work with an aspect of my current work, uh, which is on an entirely different period, place, and theological orientation uh, in the Shia world. And in inclusion, I'll advance a somewhat more nuanced theory of change and production of meaning in Islamic architecture. So I can summarize, I think, uh, in the beginning a great deal. And my work leading up to the transformation book, I've been concerned with a, a, a transformative period in Islamic architecture in the hope of creating a discourse that places difference and disjunction as the central mechanisms in the history of Islamic art rather than annoying you know, dis, uh, aberrations. So in looking at this period of the 11th to 12th centuries, I felt that it had the requisite political, theological, and symbol symbolic dimensions to make it an epistemic disjuncture. So as was said, politically, there was a rift between the Abbasids and the Fatimids. Theologically, it manifested as an intense 
an aggregated drift between rationality and, and uh, dogmatism, between Mu'tazili thought and Ash'ari Hanbali, and between a universe mediated by natural agents and one shattered by occasionalism. So the last controversy fascinated me the most, and it's the one that I applied to my rather upset, my obsession at the time with domes. Uh, and Muqarnas has already been explained to you, so I will, uh, I will move on. But I would like to say, since Muqarnas is a process, not an essence, and that's even inscribed in the term itself, Muqarnas is almost like Muhammad or mutahide. It's a word, it's, a, it's an adjectival noun that has, mutahide has wahda in it, or wahada. Uh, and uh, muqarnas has the word qarnas in it. Therefore, it is a, something that is imbued with qarnasa. Anyway, since it is a process, then it must have, I felt it must have a beginning. And Baghdad in the early 12th, 11th century was a likely place uh, for a number of reasons. The fact that it included some early domes that, such as this one, and also because it was the place, the location where the particular controversy or uh, the, a, a, a specific theology of occasionalism was being put forth by a theologian, his name is ba uh, uh, al Baqillani. So by the 12th century, Muqarnas domes and vaults are nearly everywhere in the uh, Islamic world. Laura loves this one. Uh, in in Baghdad and elsewhere. Sorry. Okay. Islamic occasionalism, I should emphasize, which was the counterpart theology of this. I should emphasize differed fundamentally in structure and in intent from Greek or Mu'tazili atomism. We really should not conflate it to occasionalism and, at and atomism. It's kind of an extreme form. It rejected causality, natural agency, mediation, illumination, or any secondary principle that would mediate between an all-powerful God and humans. And with that, I have a little trouble with the question of mediation. So it posited a universe, as we said, composed of atoms and accidents, such that uh, all attributes, sensations, uh, of an object are transitory accidents created and annihilated by God constantly. So the gist of the argument was that the Mukharnas Dome and other forms, because it was, the book is not some, just about the, the Mukharnas Dome, there are other uh, forms, calligraphic and others that were developed in this period, were produced by this period as forms that, one, symbolized occasional theology, two, manifested in Abbasid, the Abbasid's position as a safeguard of the Islamic community, and it kind of served as a symbolic glue uh, that somehow linked a divided uh, uh, Islamic world. So the quick dispersion of Muqarnas domes throughout the Islamic world led me to the general conclusion that there, was, there existed a reciprocal process between a center lacking political power but possessing legitimacy and a periphery possessing power, having power, all these days, but lacking uh, legitimacy. Therefore, they needed the Abbasids. And the, these forms, these symbolic forms were not so much created, but the reason that they were spread out so far so, so much was a form of a kind of a political allegiance to the idea of the myth. So they kind of mediate the gap that separates the, 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 the myth of unity from the reality of complete fragmentation of the Islamic community. So rather than an omnipresent feature that, that uh, uh, reflects an Islamic tawheed, I, 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 I uh, argued that Mukharnas does not predate the 11th century and that its, its spread in the Islamic world during this period is not so much as symptomatic of tawheed as it is of the success, this triumph of a particular theology. What is interesting also that in the increasingly conservative Western Islamic world, Muqarnas generally encompasses every aspect, anyone who's been in North Africa would vouch for that, every restaurant and hotel and building of all periods are completely covered with the Muqarnas. Uh, 
And I describe it as conservative because it really does cre eventually create rather oppressive atmospheres that restrict perception to the tangible but ephemeral universe. Now, when we look, when we move on to somewhat more, I suppose, open or progressive regions of the Islamic world in the Eastern uh, Islamic world, we'll see that the Muqarnas in domes has a much more limited role and uh, a different concept emerges. So here I'm going to the biggie. And I hear a gasp here from some of my Iranian friends. What is an Arab doing with this? OK. Uh, <laughs> I would like us to look at the, the dome of the mosque of Sheikh Lutfallah in Isfahan, possibly the most accomplished Safavid monument, one of the greatest domes ever built. Here we have an abundance of, of evidence for this monument. And I think it can bring us closer to understanding the, the brief with which the architect had been charged, the manner by which he was able to fill with this charge, and maybe even the meaning of this structure. It's a very unusual monument, this, the Mosque of Sheikh Lutfallah, founded in 1603 by Shah Abbas I, the first monument on the Maidan, predating the Congregational Mosque by about 15 years. It's located in the eastern side of the square, and it was most likely a private Palatine chapel connected to the royal palaces by an underground tunnel. The mosque was also built in honor of Shah Abbas' father-in-law, Sheikh Lutfallah al maisi who served as an imam al khatib for the mosque during his lifetime. And I think it was also built in order to, create, to accommodate a beautiful mystical poem on the inside written by another uh, person of Lebanese origin, Sheikh Baha'i al-Amili. Although intended as a mosque, it lacks a, a courtyard and a minaret, whose elimination, I think, were predicated on uh, aesthetic factors, namely the primacy of the dome. In fact, the plan, which is a simple dome square, was adjusted in various ways to emphasize the dome. Once inside, the vertical truss of the, of the bold turquoise moldings directs our gaze upward to a magnificent single-shell dome. The entire surface of the dome is covered in a pattern of radial arrays, concentrically staggered around a central golden yellow center filled with arabesque. Reading the movement outwards, one perceives a brilliant radiance and luminescence achieved not with actual light, there's no oculus, but through a clear system of emergence, growth, and increasing complexity. A comprehensive spiritual, and I would add rational, image has been created through completely anachronic means. Gone is the cellular structure of the Muqarnas, replaced by a rational scheme based on a smooth dome surface completely overlaid with a sun-like emanation that extends downwards through the word into the terrestrial world. A vivid illustration, I think, for the synthesis of Ishraqi Sufism and Imam Shiism has been achieved. And we see it also in the... Uh... And this is just to show you that, they, I mean, Muharmas does not vanish, but we do not see it in mosques. Now it's relegated to palatial uh, uh, architecture. Even that doesn't last, but I'm not going there. Eventually, even that idea, this wonderful sublime, uh, is it, it removed. Literally, some of these domes at some point must have, including this one, were removed and replaced by this. But I'm not uh, going there right now. To conclude, I've shown you two quite different domes, dome types, that I've attempted to interpret in the light of contemporaneous theologies. This raises a number of questions that could already be on your mind. Is this a legitimate practice, what I'm doing? Why these theologies and not others? Where is politics in this? And for, could not all of this has been simply aesthetic and ornamental, as many have suggested? I'll attempt a few answers and then leave the discussion. First, I'm not entirely certain that it is legitimate to juxtapose Islamic architectural praxis against theological discourse, since Islamic architects are not known to have engaged in such a discourse. But to borrow a phrase from one of my favorite writers, Mike Mal Michael Baxendahl, artists were not social fools and architects. They lived in their philosophical time, practiced their faith, underwent rigorous training, 
and were attentive to the wishes of their patron. At some level, there must have been some shared common language. Otherwise, their products would have been, would have fallen on not deaf ears, but on glass eyes, maybe. <laughs> since nearly, uh, second, since nearly anything can be said in the name of Islamic thought, really anything, from the most rationalist philosophy to the most dogmatic uh, theology of the Hanbalis, passing through uh, Ishraqi philosophy, uh, occasionalism, atomism, uh, I think we need to be selective. I'm neither opposing strict historicism nor free eclecticism, but rather some synchronicity, synchronicity of, of discourse when we're dealing with questions of attention. Three, political intentions, or uh, the, I think political intentions certainly played a role in this period. It's just that I didn't have time to emphasize them in this paper. Fourth, is Islamic art all about, quote, pleasing things lacking in visual symbolism, as Abu Sayyid proposed, or as Grabar said in a lecture four years before he passed, that there is nothing Shi Shiite about Shiite art. Uh, I think I'll leave that up to you. Thank you. OK, well, first off, uh, uh, thank you so much, Rose, for that really sharp uh, summary of my argument in, in the most in, from the introduction in the chapter seven on Baghdad. Seven. Mm -hmm. This uh, made me sound really uh, coherent and convincing, so thank you. Um, I wanted to just to cover a few points that um, um, either arise from or give context to that argument. And um, uh, Nagar, I probably won't go long, but will you just tell me to stop if I get longer than 10 minutes? Yes. Just come and, come and get in my face. I'm setting it up right now. Super. Okay. Um, all right. So first off, uh, I want to mention um, something about my method, which actually Rose, Rose did this so well that I, I don't really need to emphasize this anymore. But um, the uh, Islamic genealogy of new media art that I'm trying to, that I, that I pursued, um, both you know, pursued historical research to demonstrate actual, provable connections of um, you know, influence. Uh, and um, sought connections where they were disavowed, um, especially the, the historic uh, disavowal of any, um, I don't need both of these. Oh, okay. <laughs> Being in stereo. Uh, the historic dis disavowal of uh, connections between um, uh, European culture and uh, Islamic culture. But, you know, for most purposes, I'm considering uh, Islam, the, the Muslim world, and the Arab world to be part of the West, part of Western <laughs> history. Um, and then uh, finally, as part of uh, um, the dis discontinuous method, I'm also uh, inventing genealogies where, um, where none can be proven to exist in order to uh, exert pressure on contemporary imagination. Um, oops. Yeah, so uh, s since writing, <laughs> since uh, completing Enfoldment and Infinity, I've continued to pursue um, genealogies of uh, mm -hmm. contemporary philosophy in historic Islamic philosophy, as well as I can, given that this is not at all my training. Um, and in particular, I've been interested in the, um, the through line of uh, Neoplatonism. Uh, we, or the, um, the question you know, that began with the ancient Greeks of how the universe can be both uh, one and many, and um, which for uh, contemporary thinkers, uh, Deleuze has articulated more than anyone else. So I'm not going to explain this diagram, but this is my, my working diagram so far. It's already got lots of errors in it. But you see that... Um, in the uh, middle period of uh, several hundred years, uh, this work was being undertaken in the Muslim world. Uh, some of these thinkers, uh, notably uh, Ibn Sina, but uh, many others as well, 
were translated um, from Arabic into Greek, I'm uh, sorry, into uh, Latin um, in Spain beginning in the uh, 12th century. And so during that period of translation, a lot of this uh, transmission began. But then, especially after the uh, ethnic cleansing of Spain, of, of Muslims and Jews, um, and the kind of reconsolidation of Europe as a, a Christian continent, those connections got disavowed and the translation movement stopped. However, um, in uh, the Eastern Muslim world, uh, these, the, these philosophies continue to be elaborated. And most interestingly to me, um, uh, the kind of work that um, Spinoza was doing, which I'm quite sure was informed by uh, Ibn Sina's concept of the universe, university of being, um, was being carried out in, uh, I, I'm sorry, Leibniz. Leibniz more than Spinoza. Uh, what Leibniz was doing to, to, to describe a universe that is both um, one thing and yet articulated as a manifold um, is uncannily similar to what Mullah Sadra was doing in Shiraz um, about a century later. So obviously they have a common genealogy in uh, Ibn Sina and other Muslim thinkers, but I'm quite sure that they did not know about each other. So what I would like to do now, what I, you know, with, with my meager means, because I'm trained as a, you know, a film scholar, really, uh, is to try to develop um, a Mullah Sadrian genealogy for Deleuze, because it helps. So I'm just going to show you a couple of things. Oops. Oh, yes. So the way we often study uh, the history of philosophy is to leave out the Islamic contribution. Um, my, my folding method meant that uh, these guys still show up. But just, so I just took the same chart and folded it. So this is what we learn is the history of, uh, of Western philosophy, right? All that Islamic um, centuries of work is just get kind of folded up and forgotten. So I seek to unfold that history. And of course, lots of other people are doing this work. Um, OK, Rose uh, so beautifully covered um, atomism and uh, uh, atomist and occasionalist ide uh, ideologies um, that I don't really need to, to cover this. So I'll just skip. I'll show a couple of examples of uh, contemporary uh, occasionalist atomist uh, uh, media. And this is a fabulous work by uh, John F. Simon Jr. It's online. He started it in 1997, and it's still cranking away. And its goal is um, using this rudimentary pixel grid to generate every possible image uh, possible. And this, this is possible, but it will take, I forget, billions of years. So although using the, the basic uh, point, um, it gives us an idea of a mathematical infinity that's really crushing in its sublimity. Uh, there's a, um, a film strip of Paul Sharitz, similar to the film that, that Rose showed. Uh, an atomist narrative I argue, is a narrative such as the beautiful film Waiting for Happiness by Abdurrahman Sissoko, where events befall people um, and they have to deal with the outcome of events without being able to connect to understand their causes. Although in the case of this film involving uh, migrants uh, on the coast of West Africa, you know, trying to get to Europe, arriving from China, the, the unknown thing, the unknown cause that people cannot put their finger on is um, uh, global economic pressures. So when I talk about uh, atomism as a contemporary ideology and a contemporary aesthetic, it is a conservative aesthetic 
dealing with what befalls us when, when it's impossible to trace the events that befall us to their causes that are usually you know, geopolitical and economic. How's my time? You have two more minutes. Um, fine. Okay, so the thing about um, that, ch that, that chapter is about one possible manner of unfolding that I argue Islamic art suggests as a way to think about um, uh, any artwork that works with this, this three-part system Rose explained of uh, image, information, and in infinite. Um, another, uh, which I talk about later in the book, is the idea that there is an inside to the minimal parts. So this completely shatters uh, atomism. Um, and there's some uh, wonderful uh, Iranian and also Ottoman uh, calligraphic works that show these forms that you think of as um, not having an inside the lines and points of writing, and then shows them to be composed of writing, which is pretty amazing. And it's actually especially interesting that this is uh, uh, an invocation of Ali. And uh, Ali is the one who said, uh, uh, you know the Quran? Well, you know the, the first surah of the Quran? Well, you know the first word of the first surah, bismillah? You know that first letter, bay? You know the, the point under that first letter? I am that point, right? So in, um, in uh, imami mysticism, the idea that uh, Ali is a sort of privileged interpreter of the Quran makes it really great that he's the one who's invoked here as being inside of that point. Another example. Um, so in the infinitesimal, both in a traditional talismans and in the other kinds of in modern talismans. And I think there's a lot of people who carry both, you know, uh, a religious token and uh, a digital token in their pockets. Is that my time? Okay. We have two more minutes, I'm sure. So there's Jody suggesting, um, uh, of course, like in a pixel-based medium, you can't go inside the pixel. Uh, but I wanted to show you, oh, oh, I wanted to say just a little something about Mullah Sadra. Okay, yes. So, um, so Mullah Sadra, uncanny similarities to Leibniz, and um, as the uh, historian of philosophy Sajad Rizvi says, um, Mullah Sadra should be included in the body of process philosophy. Because, and this is his big um, innovation over Ibn Sina, and Mullah Sadra said, well, the, the, um, the, the um, basic entities in the world are not things, but processes. So here, Mullah Sadra also sounds very similar to Whitehead. And um, the thing that we should pay, pay attention to uh, is individuation that things um, in becoming more individuated in the process of time actually become more real. So the process of tashakhis. And it would be really fun. In fact, I plan to um, kind of care, compare uh, Mullah Sadra's account of individuation and that of uh, Gilbert Simondon, who had such a big influence on Deleuze. So I'm working with this amazing um, uh, practice-based PhD student at the University of Technology, Auckland, uh, Azade Emami. And uh, she's making artwork that tries to get inside the pixel. And um, I'm sure you'll get to see her work really soon because she's going to you know, come out with a big splash. But um, she came to me wanting to um, study Mullah Sadra and substantial motion. So she came with this completely divided interest in both atomism and you know, the opposite of atomism, substantial motion, or the idea that things um, change continuously in process. This is one of her diagrams. Uh, if you write to me, I can put you in touch with her. And uh, oh, there's another of her diagrams. I guess that's good. Thank you. Yeah. So it's uh, 
been my pleasure and challenge to um, try to come up with some questions to put you all in a provocative dialogue. Um, and I know that uh, Laura draws on Yasser's work for her own, um, but I want to uh, try and pose different kinds of questions. Um, the first one I had was about um, uh, how you discuss Islamic thought and aesthetic practice and how these things developed through um, the dialectical movement of debate between doctrinal positions. So for Laura, I'm thinking about the way that atomism attained a mystical dimension uh, through debates between the rationalist Matazala scholars and their more conservative interlocutor, interlocutors, the Ash Asheris. And for Yasser, you talk about how innovation in the Makarna's form was spurned on by a politics of identity and rivalry between Shi and Sunni communities and states. So I wanted to ask if you could discuss the impact that such intersectarian competition and debate has had on aesthetics for both of you. Uh, I'll just answer very briefly because I, I think uh, uh, Rose gave a great answer already in her uh, commentary and summary. Um, but it does, and also I, I learned a lot of this from Yasser's book, oh, come on. but I, did, I, did, I checked it against other sources. Sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I really can't, I can't do justice to, um, to what Al-Ashari did in convert, converting the, the rational um, atomism of the Mu'tazili to a mystical atomism. Um, and I, I don't really feel qualified to talk about the politics of why he did that. Um, though, I mean, it's certainly a, a politics of, um, you know, whenever some, whenever uh, a discourse becomes popular that diminishes um, uh, reason and thinking for oneself in favor of submission to a greater power, you know, you, you've got to be suspicious. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but Ashari was also a mystic. Um, and, uh, um, Questioned, questioned the capacity of uh, rational thought to um, to uh, do justice to mystical experience. Like I could interject something yeah, on the, po the political uh, side of it, and it's you know this is uh, cast very broadly, but it seems to me Islamic powers at a great mo at, at great times of stability, security. Just such as the Abbasids, for example, in the uh, late 8th, 9th, and maybe yeah, 9th century, I just feel that they had enough confidence in where they stood that they, uh, they invited, they allowed, they created the right atmosphere for further introspection and a, uh, for the adoption, the, the uh, expansion of the uh, is somewhat more rationalist knowledge. I think on the one hand, one can look at it very egotistically, it expanded their aura and everything. But at the same time, I think there was, I think uh, confidence and security in where they stood uh, played a lot into it. And the opposite seems to happen, sort of at some point, the Abbasids themselves turn and uh, make an about face with regard to uh, the Mu'tazilis. They banish them. When occasion, originally they were in uh, uh, center stage and everything, they opposed them, they began burning their books. Uh, in fact, even in, I read an account in the 11th century where they were looking at the, I'm sorry if I'm taking... No, uh, please. Uh, they're looking at the, uh, the inheritance of someone who's there, making an inventory, an inventory of the inheritance of someone. And they found among his books, uh, Mu'tazili treatises, and that was enough to accuse him of heresy and therefore to confiscate everything that he owned. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it was not really, I think early on there was a, a form of a kind of a, a dialogue mm -hmm. a, uh, to some extent. But I think after that it just became uh, suppression. Yeah. Uh, a, yeah uh, my, my question is actually more about how that uh, dynamic ends up influencing the aesthetic forms that, um, that you see at the time. I, I understood from your text, for example, yes. Yasser, that there was, um, that, 
that actually spurned on the proliferation of the Makarnas Dome because once one uh, community became, began to build forms in this way, um, it became a question of prestige or power that others wanted to also have something. Um, uh, you know, it, it, the form kind of became trendy in a way. It's a very difficult question. How does, how do we, how can we actually uh, do a kind of a step-by-step -step transmission, a translation of uh, theological discourses into uh, into built form, into architectural form. Mm -hmm. I think one one answer would be uh, more political: the politics of identity, that you define yourself against another person. For example, constantly the Fatimids were uh, and uh, and the the, the the Abbasids were at loggerheads. So. There is a kind of a, 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 an absence of transmission on, on, along these lines. But to get, to get back to the question, do we have a, a, a text out there that says that somehow the Mokarmas, fragmented domes, are related, are somehow influenced, are somehow appropriated or assimilated? I'm afraid not. It's really, it's... it's uh, it's the synchronicity of the two discourses. It's their prevalence in one particular place, namely Baghdad. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, the uh, also that there is uh, the, the form within a very short period travels throughout much of the Sunni Islamic world to the point that, for example, in in in, uh, in Fez in the Al Qarawiyin Mosque, and probably also in Cordoba. Mosques that had previously had mosaic domes were torn down and replaced by mokarnas. So, is the evidence direct? No, no. But it is, what shall I say? So much of history is the best likely story. Yeah. And that's what I presented, yeah. Okay, great, yeah. great. Um, I have another question, um, and I apologize because it's going to take, I'm going to have to, I think, run through part of Laura's argument to get to the question, but um, it's about art and agency. And Laura, you talk about how the evolution, uh, you, when you talk about the evolution of atomism, you describe how the Matazali, uh, or the Matazala espoused an atomistic ontology alongside an, is, an assumption that, quote, the cosmos had a history that could be rationally interpreted and was open to analysis. This includes the assumption that, quote, humans have self-determination and can infer what consequences their acts will have, end quote. Later, the Ashari slogan, Bila Kaif, or without asking how, expressed the impossibility of understanding the relationship between God and the world. So can you describe more precisely how this situation plays out in digital art? Uh, you explain, for example, how the situation of Bila Kaif uh, describes many people's relationship with computers. They can interact at the level of interface, but cannot penetrate the mysterious code that supports the systems that they use. If, in the Ashri worldview, ultimate agency lies with God, then where does agency lie in the digital world? With the programmer? Or does the code possess its own autonomy? Um, and Yasser, uh, what assumptions about human agency and possibility of knowledge about the world are reflected in the architectural structures of the Makarnas domes um, or, for example, the symbolism of light in the uh, Syrian Shi shrines. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I can answer that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so where, where does agency lie in the uh, uh, digital world to, to the degree that, it can, it, that this uh, atomist occasionalism describes what's going on? Um, uh, not with the code itself. Um, Except in so far as you know, new, new materialism likes to talk about how you know, material things do have uh, effects. Um, with the programmer, um, and it's it's already it's really helpful. I find whenever we encounter you know, a crash or a glitch um, or uh, some other kind of breakdown, to um, to think about the the human agents who caused it. But then we have to think about you know, who employed the programmer. We have to think about the you know, economics of proprietary hardware and software. Um, so 
we can we can get from uh, from glitch from the glitch that appears as an image to the code or the breakdown of code that causes it to the historical circumstances that in turn cause that and they mostly have to do with um, you know people writing code under pressure you know bootleg software uh, I've been thinking a lot about a uh, uh, Egyptian glitch lately. Um, but I, I, won't, I won't go into that. What so, is Egyptian um, Well, I mean, one, that there are uh, Egyptian artists who work with glitch, especially a, a, a man named Karim Lotfi. I forgot to show you a picture of his works. Um, but there, um, he takes uh, sort of textile-like um, images uh, reprocess that reprocesses them in, in uh, different kinds of software nu numerous times until they really break down, um, and then it's possible to you know, play these images almost like an animation, just using your, your slider bars and with kind of queasy making effects. But Lutfi um, told me this idea he has about compression, which is uh, that so we know that digital compression is um, uh, a set of algorithms that are used to make a file take less space. Lutfi uses compression as a metaphor for uh, what has gone on in Egyptian history, where you have to kind of make a, a sort of poor copy of mm -hmm. something that happened in the past. Um, and because of the, I have a little note, because of the, the history of uh, uh, colonialism, um, uh, pre, you know, government pressures, all these layers of pressures to um, kind of give a, oh, I'll just, oh, it's hard to summarize. Um, but basically the um, simplification that's forced over time, you know, usually for political or economic reasons, um, causes compression and distortion and introduces uh, artifacts of its own. So in fact, um, sometimes digital media really do materially show you the causes for their breakdown. Uh, bootleg media are another example in countries such as much of the Arab world where it's common to get you know, bootleg um, DVDs and they're really glitchy and poor quality. The poor quality of the image is an index of an economic Well, let's say you ask very tough questions. So the question of <laughs> where does uh, human agency lie in the creative process? I mean, for me, it you'd have one to would have to not so much historicize this question, but actually problematize it in relation to uh, the development of Islamic thought or the various ruptures in it. So the Mu'tazilis would acknowledge human agency; mm -hmm. they believed in natural law. Mm -hmm. They believed in human action. They believed that uh, humans are accountable. The uh, uh, strict uh, Hanbalis, uh, more dogmatists, did not acknowledge any form of human agency. Possibly with Al-Ash'ari or Al-Ghazali, there's a concept of kasib. Mm -hmm. Kasib, yeah, yeah the uh, acquisition, acquisition of, of uh, meritorious acts. So I suppose the creative process could fall uh, uh, could fall within that. There's also the uh, that the the the, the concept that uh, it's often repeated: God is beautiful and He loves beauty. Uh, so there is that all art is a form of glorification of God. I was in Najaf uh, recently. I'm writing a little book uh, for the UNESCO in the city of Najaf. And I had some conversations with the, some of the marjas uh, there, uh, four of them actually. I, I managed to speak in a relatively short time. In one of the questions that I asked them, among many others more expected, he said, you know, what's, what's, what, what's the deal with all this architecture you're building? Why are you spending so much money on it? All this gold and all this style work and you keep expanding. What does that mean to you? What is it? And they were taken aback because, oh, I don't know, we, we, we spend, they explain how they spend the money. But eventually they spoke about the glorification of God, but also the beauty of the imam. Mm -hmm. So they introduced the imam in there, that the imams were beautiful, 
physically, spiritually, they're luminous, and therefore, this is a form of their, uh, almost their, it's a, not their reification, but it, it's somehow, it's their glorification, but it's also their very presence is, uh, is luminous, and therefore it, uh, it should be further enhanced. So I, I would say that, uh, uh, yes, that's the way I would, at least on a very basic level, problematize it. Um, at this point, we'd like to open the floor to questions from the audience. So if anyone has. Yeah. Um, one of the early slides you just shows uh, the uh, rocks and landscape, and then some of the, uh, the mosques that seem to replicate that. Mm -hmm. And I immediately thought, okay, this looks like Cambodian Buddhist temples as well. Mm -hmm. And I wonder in creating Lauren's genealogy, as accurate as it is, whether we've missed a whole Eastern directed genealogy. I mean, we're talking you see Silk Road, but where the confluence of many ideas, mm -hmm. uh, many exchanges, uh, I guess at one point we figured it would have to be 14 or 15 different languages we'd have to know in order to study Silk Road. I'll say a little thing to that, and then perhaps you'll say more. I mean, in the in the history of Islamic art, there's a lot of study of um, um, not only uh, influences from uh, textiles imported mm. uh, along along the Silk Road as early as the um, uh, before Islam, you know, mm -hmm. seventh, sure, sixth, sure. seventh, and eighth centuries. Sasanian, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you, you see, um, I think you see some uh, Mongol textiles in, um, uh, reproduced in Byzantine and um, European medieval art. Um, uh, but the place, the place where I know in the history of Islamic art that um, uh, Asian influence occurs most strongly is uh, after the uh, Mongol invasion yeah. of Baghdad um, and the, uh, the the Timurids setting up power in um, already with the Ilkhanids, yeah, already by the and 13th the, and century. The Ilkhanids. Yeah. So uh, especially in in uh, Eastern Islamic art, everything suddenly looks very Chinese in the figurative art. Everybody's got these plump faces as you get in Chinese painting. Motifs are introduced, certain kinds of flowers like plum blossoms, cloud mm. bands, yeah. and these travel. They travel west, some of them, into Western Islamic art, and from there, um, you know, into Wedgwood, China. Mm -hmm. So, and the study of the the travel of motifs alone is a, a fabulous way to look at uh, cultural influence. Yeah, but, but just two things. One, in in terms of the, of course, the uh, your question was more on the level of the. Theological, intellectual, philosophical level, but I want, want to address that the as as well, yeah. Uh, but you know, the uh, let's not forget that the Turks came from Central Asia. They did not mm -hmm. come from Turkey, right. and they did not look like the Turks today. They looked Central Asian. They were not indistinguishable in terms of their features mm -hmm. from uh, uh, other. Uh, so they had almond eyes and you know little facial hair and. Uh, large white faces so and that was their ideal of beauty and I think that's one reason that this uh, the representation already by the 12th 13th century in Persian painting even in Minai pottery uh, it sort of switches to that is because of their their idealization of a certain facial type that is non-arab uh, I think that's very important as far as the history of ideas and I really I mean I have to say that I'm 
as guilty as uh, my other colleagues in Islamic studies, which is what we tend to look west, not east. And I think that uh, is often the case. However, there's no question in my mind that there is some, some forms of Islamic asceticism, uh, Sufi practices were greatly influenced by Hinduism. There's no question about that, I think. Even, even Islamic occasionalism, which should be distinguished from atomism, is, uh, I think, related because I think in, uh, as far as I know, in uh, uh, medieval Indian philosophy, that uh, concept also prevailed. So there, is, there are linkages on both yes. levels. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. That's the me? Oh, or either. Either. That's what do you good. think? I yeah. I would not. I mean, there are. It is. I think it is. Uh, it's a common reaction when looking at a dome to begin uh, downward and to look upwards. And there's no question that historically, there's no question. Let's say there's an a priori in the human mind, it seems to me, that there is something that is domical is somehow related to heaven, okay? Mm -hmm. Is it, am I like channeling Carl Lehman or others? I think, nevertheless, it, it, it goes beyond that. Now, let's say the dome is the, uh, to use a term from Gombrich, is a schema, yeah? And I don't know if people even read Gombrich anymore. Uh, I think every culture imposed on this very ethereal idea because a very, smooth dome with nothing on it is a little boring you know and it doesn't say anything cultural so every culture therefore attempted to enculturate it in the way the uh, the dome was christianized generally early on is by the use of mosaic cycles on it in the islamic world they could not go in that direction because of anti-conism early on and i i think what i'm suggesting is that the dome became a kind of a reference to a particular kind of a universe now, is it a session, is, it, is, is one supposed to read in it a certain level of, of a session? I suppose it is not, it's inevitable. What was the second part of your question? Oh, uh, I'm just going back to more technology. Oh, is there, is there a kind of an interconnection uh, in, uh, there are definite, yeah, there, I mean, whether in the Mokarnas or certainly in the dome that I showed, uh, the last one, I think in that last one, especially in that drawing that was made by this wonderful, anonymous person that I found on the internet, Derek Kaplan, I would love to meet him and shake his hand because he did a wonderful job with this. Uh, if anyone here knows him, you know, tell me. He's British, I think. <laughs> but his analysis of that dome is really wonderful because his, uh, he divided it into, he did not know that, but it actually is divided into eight levels. Eight is a very significant number. Uh, because the seven levels of ascension for Sufis end with the eight, the Hurqalya, the ultimate, the Wahdat al Wujud. Yeah, so there is, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know, Mukharnas, I suppose, also. Yeah. But I, I think I have an answer. Sorry. I think I have a specific answer to your question about uh, is there something about a dome that's going to be inside a point? I actually have that, that here. Um, so uh, there's a, um, a discourse about domes. For example, there's an article by uh, Oleg Grabar talking about the relationship between bowls and domes. Uh -huh. uh, he's not, I don't think he's talking about Mukarnas there. No. But he's talking about certain bowls that um, seem like a sort of inverse image of, or an inverse uh, dome. So if the dome has, you know, often domes have cosmic motifs, it looks like it's looking up at the cosmos and being awed by, you know, the infinite. Um, well, there are bowls that also have cosmic motifs. And I, I brought a, a very special one here, an Indian bowl with a human-headed fish. I actually don't know a lot about this particular one, but there's a lot of bowls with images of uh, fish, hairs, other things that have this heavenly connotation. 
And Oleg Grabar says, for somebody who owned a bowl like this, you know, looking into it, they could both enjoy the, the, you know, the awe of seeing this like tiny replica of the cosmos and have a feeling of power over it. So this is a little bit cheap, but I, I compared that to, uh, to Google Earth um, because, uh, um, because we, you know, when we, with, with this and other kinds of software that allows us to miniaturize and seemingly control a surveillance view of the world, you know, it seems like having the, the heaven in our hands. So. Thanks, thanks to whom and what kind of powers. Uh, I had a kind of question about the art and agency. Um, at the end of, uh, um, so at the end of the last session we were talking when um, Mark was talking about metalheads and um, um, I made a comment about it, their legitimacy was measured by their degree of autonomy from the state, their sort of distance from the mm -hmm. state, right? That was like a measure of their authenticity mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. their sort of indigeneity. But what's so interesting about that, about what you guys are talking about, is um, sort of the atomism. I mean, is you know, the whole like encompasses the atom. Is that there's no meaning to the atom unless you're part of this like you know, this huge this unity. Mm -hmm. part, I mean, that's the only way it's given this kind of meaning. It's a very different sense. I mean, the agency um, of the of the atom has no meaning without. The Whole, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a very different conception. I mean, I don't want to sort of essentialize it and be like, oh, it's the Muslims think more like that in a communal terms, which is sort of a theory I've been hearing banded about lately. Um, but there is the sense of belonging to the unity, and who belonging to that unity is that is where you get your significance and your meaning, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's the scene as actually that kind of belonging is like sort of the path to the source of this. I think this is more your question, oh, but come I, on. I, would, no, I, think it would I do have something to you do say great, about it. You know, I think. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Rock on. Um, I think that uh, occasionalism or atomism, you know, those like ninth or so century philosophies, wouldn't be the thing to go to um, to try to explain a sense of communal agency or like the diminishment of individual subjectivity. Because I think, you know, if you were a pious I don't know, Ashari or um, uh, Al Bakilani style mm -hmm. um, occasionalist, you would be you would be so aware at every moment that it was God's grace mm -hmm. that was holding you know like your your nose to your face. <laughs> Speaking of noses again, and every moment you'd be like, oh, thank you God for you know keeping all my parts together. Thank you God, and uh, you would exist in this grace. And yeah, everybody else around you would exist in that too. But I think um, occasionalism. And atomism uh, emphasize the, the agency of, of God rather than like dispersed um, or communal human agency. It seems to me to be a certain fetishization of like autonomy as a source of all creative creativity versus you know uh, fetishization mm. of just a submission as mm -hmm. a, a, a path to some right. sort of or access to the great divine creative, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think may, you know, maybe maybe there would be an interesting way to think about um, some kind of occasionalist mindset, um, you know, in parallel to the way people talk about new materialism as attributing agency not only to humans but you know, to other uh, organic and non-organic entities, as if to see how in some kind of mm -hmm. mutual action um, among us things take place. You know, God would have to kind of slip out of the picture. <laughs> I mean, for any of us here to slip into occasionalism would be a, a tremendously weird experience. I think there was a, maybe a little time in my life where I just sort of like when I was going to the mosque a lot, and I, I saw myself slipping into this kind of world, and I said, ah. <laughs> but I, you know, I come across Saudis uh, or you know whatever. I don't want to generalize Saudis, but like devout Muslims who. Every other word is praising God, or uh, or just like uh, referring to God, or you know, one time I'm sitting in the airport, like in the '70s, with some uh, this Saudi sheikh and his disciples, and the AC unit went off, and I said, 
why don't they fix it? They said, all in the hands of God. I said, fine, it's in the hands of God, but they should, <laughs> somebody should go there and take care of it. And, you know, but anyway, but it's, uh, we make a, I mean, the, the point about <clears throat> that Adam's, Adam's accidents on their own have no meaning and no permanence and no significance. It is only when they're uh, used in a, uh, this kind of a grouping, this kind of a, 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 a context that they seem to have any kind of a, a uh, significance, any referent uh, is really, I think, is a, I think I would accept that. But also, it, it's referring simultaneously. One have to say, you know, both probably to some idea of a, of course, the, uh, the, the God-created fragmentary ever-controlled universe, but also to the patron, you know, the state, because it kind of an Islamic, Islam doesn't really, cannot, poss cannot exist without a state. <laughs> I, mean, I suppose it does, but historically it has always existed under the rubric of a state. And we, we live in a world where the state has vanished since the, uh, you know, the end of the Ottoman Empire, the Caliphate, which is what Bin Laden was harking about for many years when he first came out. So anyway, sorry. I think Hamt had a question. Yes, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the, uh, no doubt, pertinent uh, nuance that both of you have been. Uh, what was the adjective? Pertinent. Pertinent nuance. Uh, nuance between uh, activism and occasionalism. And, uh, right. and uh, again, I don't know if the role of this is very limited, but. Uh, uh, the longer speech that I did not uh, read uh, this morning, uh, I, I stumbled upon and made use of a uh, commentary, uh, Marmura's commentary on Ghazali's uh, mm -hmm. The Orient of the Philosopher. And uh, he basically said that, so okay, there was a rejection of any attempt to view nature as close to kernel and as a necessary system, uh, or to view God as how limited to mm -hmm. uh, human conception of uh, justice and free will. And he then basically goes on to suggest that this critique on the part of Islamic speculative theology, <coughs> Kalam, vocational, mm -hmm. um, in the direction of Hellenized philosophy, the, the falsafa, <coughs> uh, as characteristic of the Asherite school, um, in the case of Ghazali, leads to, to the following that. Um, um, they used strategically, uh, negatively, if you like, the thought of the Greek atomists. Definitely. Uh, subscribing to a metaphysics of transient atoms and accidents for which material bodies are composed. This is Marmora now. So it regarded all temporal existence as the direct creation of God, decreed by his eternal attribute of will, and enacted by his attribute of power. And then the important thing, that what humans habitually regard as sequences of natural causes and effects are in reality concomitant events, mm -hmm. whose constant association is arbitrarily decreed by the divine will. Now, I understood this to mean, and there are beautiful examples to be found in Ghazali, acceptance of the coherence, that um, in the critique of the Hellenized Aristotelian metaphysics, uh, with the help of the atomists, uh, what results is not so much as what substituted for this ancient metaphysics is not so much an other metaphysics, uh, an atomist metaphysics, um, but you know the freedom and, and omnipotence of, of God. Um, but it is not so much the case that the occasionalism itself has a physical or metaphysical theory of the properties of things beyond Greek atomism. Could, could one say that, that so that so clearly the theological occasionalism is not the same as the Greek atomism? It's not. But I would say. it used no, uh, the atomistic arguments, like. That's Al Ghazali. Al Ghazali. That's what he does. He has uh, even Al Ashari. Al Ashari was a Mu'tazid. He was a rationalist early on in his life, and then he converted. Even Al Ghazali went through a period of shak doubt and. Uh, 
but there's no question that he was very deep, very well read in, uh, in uh, Greek philosophy. And I think he uses it, he inverts it. He, uh, he, he turns it around in order to, uh, as you said, to... Uh, uh, what, what does it mean to invert it? I mean, yes, to, uh, well, I don't want to claim that here, like, you know, my ignorance, because I'm not, uh, you know, we should have here somebody in Islamic philosophy who can uh, uh, sort of deal with this a lot more effectively. But I think he used, uh, he, he used Greek philosophy, and he used, he subverted the uh, atomistic thought, which, which accepted a kind of a god as a first creator, but then that the 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 the, the, uh, uh, the universe had its own had natural laws and therefore it uh, God did not need to be involved in every uh, uh, little minutia of, of human uh, of human details. I think in uh, with the uh, Al Ghazali, he rejected that. He rejected human agency. He rejected uh, natural law. Uh, but he had to know what he was doing because in order to reject something, you have to know exactly what it is in order to argue against it. I'm not really being as uh, to the point as you would like me to be, but well, at I'd this like moment, to I... Add a, another thing, mm -hmm. which is that um, uh, Islamic atomism really is not mainly derived from Greek atomism, mm -hmm. as I understand. Uh, I understand that they only received some you know, oral accounts of mm -hmm. you know, versions of Democritus or something, and that. Uh, Islamic atomism mostly develops out of the, the Kalam theologians, these rationalist theologians, trying to um, um, trying to figure out what are the basic units of matter, and um, what uh, in, in order to um, in order to define you know what is what are the limits of human agency and, and, and God's agency, and I think. There are also concepts that are directly from, from the Quran and the way that the Islam theologians uh, developed um, the Quran's ideas of um, existence and non-existence, as I was mentioning to you before, mm -hmm. which are different from Greek thought. Because the Quran has these ideas that um, God brings something into existence. And um, that, that's what allowed, you know, by saying kun, to it, you know, be, and that's what allowed the Kalam theologians to to think about, you know, what is you know what is the, the scale of things that come into existence, and how long do they subside, and you know, what are their dimensions? You know, they figured out that they were square, um, so they did all that with you know with very little help from Greeks. of that. 
fragmentation that carries a lot of you know poetry emotion to and as we know that she studied the top dog and we know that there has been this kind of research that she's done. So what we're having here is a century exchange in some capacity between cinematic poetry and there are these puzzling moments of to whom is she talking to? And it seems that 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 we're dealing with a conversation with the God, whether we go through this <coughs> of a, a flower in cross-section. Uh, and it's, it's just like a womb 
for the fetus inside. You know, it's right there. They're all over carpets. You know, I suspect that um, uh, Ottoman carpets, uh, but for a while they, they stopped using the floral motifs because I think they were just a, com a competition with um, sort of divine agency, with this kind of uh, um, uh, vegetal and you know very similar to uh, to human female uh, agency to reproduce. And uh, I do know that medieval, you know, maybe like twelfth century um, uh, Arabic science knew knew understood how um, you know, uh, fertilization and, uh, and gestation occurred. So there, there's knowledge of that. Do you know anything about that, yes, sir? I'm already enough troubled with that. <laughs> but, uh, I've never actually, I mean, I've seen some work done on these floral motifs uh, in uh, Quranic uh, set of chapter headings or sura markers and so on. Uh, not in any kind of a... Have you ever them womb-like? Not womb-like. No, I have not heard womb-like. In fact, I have not really read any interpretation of them. It just tended to be very sort of rudimentary mm -hmm. uh, classification mm -hmm. kind of thing. So no, well, I have I, not... I, just, uh, I can't not think heard. of any but other But I think the I idea of growth is very interesting mm -hmm. in a set of growth in, in, in carpets and organic growth mm -hmm. is... Uh, yeah, and they're, is, they're really uh, powerful um, yeah. parallels to um, the genetic algorithms. I mean, it's not an interpretation. I mean, this would be an interpret... I, it would be an interpretation like what were you saying? An imaginary interpretation, kind of a... Mm -hmm. It would be... Uh, an invented genealogy. Invented genealogy, that kind of... Yeah. Uh, it's not likely. I don't know what kind of sources. You know, possibly today, but like, you know, something anthropological might shed some light on it. Mm -hmm. The actual producers yeah. of these... Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, weirdly enough, this particular uh, woman's writing right in the midst of a family planning campaign, a decade of family planning, and mm -hmm. more and more excited by what's going on here.